Yeah, we can start. All right, 2.15, ready to go? Could everyone hear me? I was, heard, I was told this mic is fussy. Is that true? Yeah, good? All right. Cool, so, you know, I'm back. You know, here I am again. <laughs> it's been like 10 minutes without Nicole, oh my god. <laughs> um, all right, so what we're here to talk about today is uh, hacking APIs and web services. So I think we heard a lot earlier about like, Things are changing, APIs are being consumed by you know, all sorts of different IoT devices, and there's a blockchain, and there's all these new things that are happening. And I feel like as developers, we need places to experiment with what is, gonna, with, with, with what is changing, experiment with APIs, experiment with you know, sort of like where the needle is moving. And I don't know if there's necessarily enough applications out there that help accomplish that. So we wrote one, and we wrote a application called Pixie, and we're gonna introduce that to you today. So this is us. This is Nicole Becker. She does everything. <laughs> She's one of the Brooklyn Leader chapters. She teaches at NYU. She breaks everything ever for money. She's been doing this a really long time. She also saves all the animals. <laughs> I'm Tanya Janka. Um, I was a developer a really She's long a time. I'm a Canadian. That's so the that's accent so that you hear. In a comedy. <laughs> so I apologize so much. I can't help it. Um, so we've both been doing this a really long time. We're both members of WIA, Women in AppSec, and we've both been nominated for WASPies this year. So like, if you want to vote for us, we won't. That oh, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. So we do lots of stuff. So this is the We Are Qualified, Please Listen to Us slide. OK, next, outline. Yeah. OK, so I kind of, as I mentioned before, you know, like in, in my job, in my life, I'm asked to look at web apps, and there's APIs that are driving these web apps, there's mobile apps, there's APIs that are driving those mobile apps. These APIs kind of lurk behind the curtain. Sometimes they're not very well advertised, sometimes they're difficult to know that they're there, but they're always back there, and people are using them, people are consuming them. And so I was like, you know what, there's not really a great way to test APIs, or look at bad APIs. So you could say, hey, that's not what you do. Like We want to like look for like obviously bad APIs, so you can know how to build good APIs. So we need more places to learn, as I had mentioned before. Right? Um, and so today, we, we think that we could show you that we could hack them. We're going to use an OWASP tool because it's an OWASP event. We're trying to promote OWASP and like, you know, women in app security, OWASP, OWASP projects. You know, like this is an inclusive group. We need more people who want to participate and write software, write mm -hmm. tools. So that's, I'm not going to pitch too hard, but there might be another slide or two, right? We need There's help on our project. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, more. we will tell you more later. Yeah. So we're going to look under the hood today, basically. We're gonna look under the hood, you're gonna look at the APIs, and we're gonna, yeah, we're gonna show you lots of problems. Yeah, we did this. Yeah, we did yeah. this. Yeah, all right, oh, so, okay. so what's going on? I mean, this is sort of like where the world's moving, right? There's the API economy, right? There's been this paradigm shift. I mean, everybody deals with this word DevOps now. It's like a new word that everyone says every day. Yep. Um, you know, the end of the monolithic application, like, all right, we don't have this big one box that does all these things. We have little distributed microservices that sit in containers on clouds and spin up and spin down and do whatever they want. You know, we have front-end frameworks that just want APIs. We have third-party APIs. We have the open data programmable web that advertise APIs. We have serverless computing. I mean, that's pretty crazy. Uh, we have the cloud, the whole DevOps agile thing, automation, continuous integration, continuous delivery. So this is sort of where the world's moving, right? And APIs are the central pipeline between all of these different services. So yeah, I mean, we can make this like a little interactive. If anyone has questions or wants to, you know? At any point, you can interrupt us. Yeah. So all right. It's coming. Oh, it's coming. <laughs> well, I guess that would be technically kind of like a cloud service, right? Third party, yeah. OK, so the OWASP top 10. Who's here, who here has heard of the OWASP top 10? OK, awesome. Nice work. So Surprising, you, you know. Right? <laughs> so you may, you may know that there's like a new release candidate this year for 2017. And if you look at our slide, number 10 is underprotected APIs. So not only us think that this is a serious problem, but all of OWASP thinks that's a problem, too. Um, Oh, I thought we took the slide out, facts and proof. So lots of places are having their APIs hacked, like those places. 
you want to talk about the current? Yeah, and some of the good ones, I mean, there's been, a, there's been a bunch of these. If you just Google API vulnerabilities, you'll find a ton. But some of the fun ones are like, apparently Nissan had developed a mobile app so that you could control non-critical car functions using the mobile app. And the only authentication piece of that app was the VIN number. So if you just had the VIN number, which you could just like clearly see on the windshield or like the inside of a door or whatever, you could actually just like you know, send it a, a change the radio or turn the wipers on or you know do things like that. So that was sort of like funny, but not because you know it's controlling pieces of a uh, you know non-critical functions of a car. But it just sort of highlights how like you know APIs like are there, but they're not really being that sort of scrutinized. So well and it, it could be used maliciously, right? Like imagine you're driving and then everything turns on at full blast at you, right? Like this could cause accidents, distractions, other things like that. Yeah, and this was only like last year. Um, Candy Crush. <laughs> This was like, I mean, this is sort of just funny, right? But Candy Crush is an API, right? And I don't know, does anyone even play Candy Crush anymore? It's over now, right? <laughs> I think it is, yeah. Maybe like three years no ago, I've been like, people no. have been actually playing Candy Crush throughout the talk. Um, <laughs> so, what, you know, it was this game with candy and colors, but there was an API that was driving the whole app, and this guy figured out, he just like, you know, you know, spun up some wire sharks and proxies, sat in the middle there, figured out this API was going on, figured out how to change some of the calls around so that he got unlimited lives, and like beat all the levels and like, yeah. which is like kind of an achievement, right? It takes three minutes to do each level and there's 500 levels. That's assuming you actually complete each level for the first, like you win each level. So he did that all really quickly and like won the game and you know, it's funny. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> So um, OWASP thinks it's such a big deal that Zap actually released a new uh, new functionality so that you can parse APIs, um, Wizzles and uh, JSON, and it's released part of its scanner so that you can scan them and try to find some stuff. And we're going to show you a little bit of that today if we yeah. have time. Yeah, and it just actually like keeps getting it like came out in April, but I think like a new, the latest version came out like like two weeks ago. Yeah. So we've been using Zap. Zap's API plugin to test our API, which has been really good for getting everything yeah. to be. For us and for them. So yeah. we're giving them feedback because it's both open source. So we're like, hey, did you find this? And we're going back and forth with them. So we're improving their thing while they improve ours. All right. Cool. We're going to do that. All right. So um, Pixie, I think the goal of this, of this app is going to be part of this new project. And we're calling this project Dev Slop, right? And we're kind of doing this because the DevOps world is you know, exploding and everyone talks about it. And like, we want to really highlight like, what could actually go wrong in this DevOps world. Right? We're moving faster. Things are, code's getting pushed to production quicker. You know, containers are being spun up to do small little things and then being dropped back down. Like, what could go wrong? So we're sort of like trying to make this become a suite of applications that show off all the DevOps problems. So if anybody who has, everyone has a good DevOps story, horror mm -hmm. story only. Yeah. Um, please let us know because we're looking for ideas. I mean, we have a few, but we want to like really find good, good, like real life looking ideas. So Pixie's going to be the first step, and we're going to slowly release things over the next while with training and videos and other things to go with it to help people learn. All right. So what is Pixie? Pixie is a P uh, picture sharing application. Yes, yeah, very similar to the, some of the other common, well-known picture photo sharing applications. You could upload photos, you could like photos. There's a fun little thing here where you could love a photo and you send somebody a little micropayment as a sort of like saying like, I really love your photo. Instead of just getting the heart going, you like send them a little micropayment. You know, it's not a bad idea. Um, it's being powered by, you know, it's a mean stack app. It's got Mongo, Angular, Node, Express. It's written, it's in a bunch of Docker containers. It's using, it has an open API spec. That was, you know, I use Swagger because it makes it look really pretty. Um, it uses JSON web tokens and JSON. Um, it's highly vulnerable and it's fun to break. So we're going to show. It has a lot of problems. Yeah. We're going to show you a couple today. Yeah. OK, so you might wonder what an OWASP project is. So if people want to get involved with OWASP, there's lots of different ways. And one of the ways is to create a project. So a project can be super fun because you build something or you write something. So there's documents, there's code projects, and then there's tool projects. So like Zap is a tool project. Here we have like, see that movie poster? That's like core rule set three for mod security. It's the free WAF that OWASP creates. So like there's currently like 93 active projects. So like if you want to create an open source thing that's super awesome that helps application security, this is a great way to do it and get lots of visibility. It's very fun. Yes, Tom? What? Nicole and I are going to get rich. 
Wow. I didn't even know that. <laughs> we're getting, it's like we're getting paid 10 bucks an hour or something at this point. <laughs> cool, thank you. So, so like there's, like I was saying, so like there's different maturity levels, like flagship, lab, incubator, but basically like projects are cool, you should check it out if you like to build stuff. Okay, so uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about Zap, like why use Zap? Zap's the open Z, uh, the OWASP Z attack proxy, it's free, so you can use it, it's like beginner level all the way to very advanced, there's tons of extra plugins and things you can add to it, all of it's free, there's lots of documentation, there's lots of videos about how to use it, if you want to start learning about how to scan web apps, like from the very beginning, this is a good place that you can start without spending a lot of money. And they just added WSDL and JSON support, and we find that exciting. Yeah. Okay. JSON oh, um, so it's, it compares JSON files for you, so you can take a look at them better. And then it scans them and looks for vulnerabilities. JSON stands for JavaScript. JSON is oh, a notation of it's a JavaScript notation, right? So we would use we're going to be showing a lot of JSON in this API, but a lot of speak JSON, a web exactly how to parse it. So it's a standardized format, just like HTML is or XML and things like that. All right, so demonstration. This is the best part. So let's get this right. All right. All right, so this is publicly available. We're going to show you exactly how to get it later. But uh, I guess I should just full screen it. This is Pixie. Yeah. Isn't she pretty? <laughs> So this is Pixie, right? I mean, it is a social photo sharing website. So let's start poking around. We could register for an account. Um, we're going to be uh, questionable user Number three. three. <laughs> There's a lot of questionable users already in Pixie. We log in. You know, and we're going to get a little bit more into this. There's so many vulnerabilities here. We're only going to do like a handful because we don't have enough time. But uh, what we're really trying to do here is like there's OWASP top 10 mode where you could actually, if you click on this, you know, you could sort of see some of the vulnerabilities as they map up against the OWASP top 10. And then there's going to be CTF mode. And CTF mode, we're going to build this interactive scoreboard because I think it makes CTFs a little bit more fun. But there's basically a series of challenges here that are sort of like, they could be a little bit better well described, but they're, you know, it's getting there. Um, and they're going to be things that you would sort of like look for and you'd want to like, you know, achieve these goals and get points and things like that. This is a learning tool, right? Um, pix Capture again? the flag. Capture the flag, yeah. It's a Packer tournament, right? It's the way we joust. Um, so, all right, so Pixie has an API. We're going to get to that. Uh, some stats. You know, it's a photo sharing site. You could, uh, you could like photos. You could give them little micro payments. Looks good. Pretty. It's very pretty. I will say that the way that these photos got loaded is using random words that were scraping another API. So I can't be held responsible for what shows up. <laughs> <laughs> like if you look through, it's just fun to Sometimes read them. Sometimes I would run these. I would be like, whoa! Like <laughs> I don't know how it got there, but it did. <laughs> so. Oh, well, there's no real money yeah. as part of Pixie, which is good because it's very vulnerable. Yeah, I thought about building <laughs> no, a little bit of a, some sort of blockchain -y thing there, some sort of open ledger, but you know, everyone is welcome to join the project. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. You have a profile. You know, there, there I am, crop shells. <laughs> Again, this whole thing is based on a series of random keyword, random words and sentence generators. So, again, I, you know, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> All right, so we could upload a photo. We're going to upload our, our lunch, because that's what everyone on social media does. Man locate. <laughs> that's an awesome name for your lunch. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to walk through a few of these things, right? So one of these, like one of the most like sort of low-hanging vulnerabilities here is there's this like little secret menu bar item and like the little shady looking guy there and it's disabled, right? And we get a verbose error message. So what's the problem with a verbose error message, right? We all know what the problem is. It leaks information about the application that you just don't want to be leaked, right? Um, so we see here it says server.conf is not a function. So what is server.conf? Yeah. Maybe we should check it out. So that's like some bad coding that actually tried to execute a config file. Whoops. So, you know, we sort of can make this inference. You gotta like, you know, think this through a little bit here that server.conf is actually sitting right there in the public web directory, which it is, and this is controlling a session secret, right? 
All right. That's bad. <laughs> so what is this session secret? So let's go. Let's look at our API. I like that we have a dance thing going on. Yeah. Let's look at our API spec. So we have this beautiful API spec that is, you know, really well defined. And it's pretty. And it's pretty. This is Swagger. Swagger has got a really good uh, CSS, you know, suite there that like makes APIs look beautiful. So, um, all right, all right. So let's try to log in here. Let's see that. We see that there's this post request, right? That is on the path API slash login will allow you to log in, right? And there's a little bit of information around what it's expecting, some response codes, things like that. So we're going to open a tool called Postman. Has anyone ever used Postman? Nice. Pretty sweet API tool, right? Um, we are going to log in. We're using the free version, just so you know you could do this too at home. So our API is on port 8090, and we are going to log in. We hit send. Sorry, invalid login, because we didn't actually try to log in. We give our username, questionable user3, at example.com, our password, sweet. Oh, I, I bombed that. Yeah. Three, 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 number questionable user. You have to knock out the able. Yeah, it was question. question. Oh, it was question. All right, thanks, guys. I was like, we didn't do anything yet. All right, so we got a token, right? And what is this token? Has anyone ever used JSON web tokens, JWTs, before? Yeah, so what's a JSON web token? So what this is, it's a way of authenticating. It's not really that much different than a cookie, right? And a cookie is a way that a browser maintains session state. But a JSON web token is something that APIs use. You know, there's, there's tons of different ways you could authenticate an API. There's OAuth. There's, you could use Open API. You, uh, you could use J, JWTs. But JWTs are sort of exploding a little bit more in popularity because they're easy, right? And so what happens is there's that session secret that we saw. And the web server will sign, that, will sign a string of characters like this with that session secret, ship it off to the user. The user will store it and present it on every subsequent web request. And the web server will know that it actually sent it to you because it'll decrypt it with that secret. Right? So what could go wrong? Um, a lot, as it turns out. Well, there's a few things that could go wrong with JWTs. The first is there's a really great website called JWT.io that will decode JSON web tokens. So we're going to drop our token in here. Right? And it's funny, right? Because like, you know, I don't know if those colors are really showing, but there's like the red at the top, and there's like this magenta, and there's this blue. So the red is the crypto sort of the type of token and the cryptography that it's actually using, right? And the magenta is the payload. And this string of characters, this is not actually encrypted. This is encoded, base64 encoded. So you drop that into any base64 decoding you know, tool on the internet, and you're gonna get that same data, right? So the problem here is that I'm just storing way too much data. I put the entire user object in the JSON web token, which is why the token is so long. But so now forever, that JSON web token travels across the internet, and anybody that captures that web token will be able to just quickly base64 decode that and have usernames and passwords, right? So logging, very confusing. right. So logs will pick this up. So what do you do? You don't store that much in your JSON web token. You store one thing: user ID, right? Or however you authenticate your user. However you want to keep track of who that user is. Maybe it's an email address. I don't know. You store one thing, not everything, which is what we did. All right. Any questions? Cool. Yeah. yeah. Why would you use a user ID rather than a large nonce value? Because I don't know how to program. So, you know, that's that's why. Because this is what you see in real life. People put all sorts of stuff in there. Are so signed? Yeah, so that, that secret, the signature that we saw in the comp file earlier. Down here, this is, so it's signed, and the, that session secret that you saw before, that's how the web server will know to decrypt it. it. It's the only one that's supposed to know that session secret. But because everybody knows it now, you could create your own signed JSON web tokens, and the server will believe that they are real, too. All right. So another problem that you could find with APIs is 
we're going to look at our spec. And if we want to get all the pictures, we see that it's expecting a token on a query string or an access token as a header value. So that means that we go back to Postman and we, yeah, it's totally married. We bring up a get request and we are going after localhost 8090 API pictures, right? So we hit send. Yep. So we hit send, it says no token provided. We grab our token. We add this header that it wants called x access token. We drop it in. We hit send. And now we get a, this is, oh, he's gone, JSON uh, object of all of our photos. So we look down and we see all of our photos. And this is exactly what Angular is calling when it, when you load the entire app. It's just calling, this is calling the API and saying, give me all the pictures. And it just parses through, Angular just parses through all that JSON and presents all the pictures on the internet. What else, you could, you could also add, if you tick off that token, you get no token provided. But the token is also completely valid on the URL string, on the, get on the URL. So, you know, again, in APIs, you see this too. Tokens going across gets on, on the URL string, right? So why is that a problem? Logs. Logs, right. That's going to sit in a Apache access log or Nginx access log until the end of the next day <laughs> or whenever they rotate logs. For a really <laughs> long time yeah. if it's Pixie. Yeah. All right. <laughs> we don't have a lot of expiry on our tokens either. <laughs> yeah. It'll last for years and months and years. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right. So next up, uh, let's look at our delete method, right? So we see here a user can delete a photo. It wants X access token. We're familiar with that now. And it wants a picture ID, right, as a query string. It's a helpful developer. All right. So let's go back to Postman. And this time we're making a delete request. And we're going HTTP, localhost 8090, API, picture, delete. We hit send, no token. We're familiar with that message. X access token. Drop that in. No picture specified delete. So we say picture ID equals. And we need a picture ID, right? And so, I don't know. Let's see how this developer did. Uh, Where's that lady we don't like? This, this lady looks <laughs> really weird. <laughs> there's, there's one we like deleting a lot, but she's not there right now. Yeah, I don't know. That lady looks, she's, she's too contemplating for me. <laughs> All right, 206. Hit send. Photo 206 deleted. We refresh this page, and she is gone. So what went wrong there? So the developer set up the API so that you could not access this unless you actually had a valid token. But the developer did not do the work of checking to make sure that that was actually your photo. And that's exactly what happened with Facebook. With Facebook. Did we skip over that example? Yeah, we did. I think we did. Yeah. So I think it was like a year and a half ago, Facebook had a problem with their Android app. If you had an invalid token via the Android app, you could use that token and delete anyone's photo or photo album if you knew that ID string of that photo or photo album. So this guy did it, and you know Facebook had to fix it in their API. So yeah, I mean, I didn't, you know. This. And then he deleted Mark Zuckerberg's photo to prove his point because yeah. that's what people do. Yeah. All right. So the next one. So um, CSRF. Who's familiar with CSRF? Cross-site request forgery. Yeah, we're all familiar with that, right? So this is a fun one. So. I have my photo, which is lunch, right? And I see that there's this delete method, the, the delete photo bot, uh, button at the bottom. So I go to inspect element, which is what we all love to do. And I see when user clicks on this button, it calls this method user delete photo picture ID, right? So I go down, find the JavaScript associated with that, and I see that User delete photo, here it is, it's an Angular, it's a little Angular, it's a little Angular app. Um, so it's calling HP get slash user delete photo 
and a photo ID. All right, so I'm deleting a photo on a get request. So what's the problem there? Should be delete, right? We, we got to get real right here, right? If we're going to make a good API, it should be delete. But this is this happens. This is a real thing. You could, you know, there's no enforceability here. You could run. You can do whatever you, you want. You can do it on whatever method you want. You know, patch. I don't know. Does anyone use that? Right. <laughs> um, all right. So let's see. Let's see how we can mess around with this. Hold on. I got to get out of my. Uh, is actually hold on so in this demonstration we're going to cross site request forgery ourselves because we don't have time to have two computers to have her fish me but imagine you receive an email seriously with chrome, a link if you full screen chrome in developer you tools you just can't escape just, ever you can't get out of it All right, it's okay, Chrome. Um, all right, so we were gonna try to figure that user method out. All right, so we're gonna go to localhost, user delete photo, and we need a photo to delete. So let's find another photo. This, another contemplating person. That looks Being weird. horse. So we're gonna try to see if that works. Sorry, cannot delete, not your photo. So here the developer is actually putting the delete method, running a delete request on a get method, which is a problem, but is doing the work of checking to make sure that it's actually your photo, right? Because that's what you see on the page. So you can't delete this photo. But if I found one of my own photos, and I see it's 220, and I throw in 220, I will now have just deleted my own photo. So anyone could CSRF that as a link and convince you to click on it and delete your own photo. This is a way of taking down somebody else's photo. And there, there are protections in here, right? There is a CSRF uh, CSRF, which is a little node uh, module that will protect against CSRF, but it only does it against posts and deletes, unless you explicitly say you want it to happen against gets. So the problem is the developer should never run that over the get. Should have been over the delete. All right, um, let's try one more. Let me just get out of this full screen business. Cause, uh, all, right. all right, so last one we are going to demo is we're going to bring up Zap. And we're going to try the whole I forgot my password and I don't remember it business. All right, so we were a questionable user. Question user. Three. Yeah, thanks, guys. Example.com. And if I don't know my password, failed authentication. Now I'm going to set a breakpoint and zap. I'm going to type in some junk. I'm going to step through these. All right, so here we go. So now I spun up a proxy that's sitting in the middle of my web request, and I see the post request come through with my username and password in it. It cannot make this bigger. There is no making this bigger. Um, and I am going to edit my password to be bracket dollar ne bracket equal. I'm going to hit this play button, and I have just bypassed the authentication scheme on Pixie using MongoDB injection. So what that was doing, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So you wanna? I feel like you you, you, you love it. <laughs> okay. So SQL injection is where you trick the computer to well the interpreter into using your SQL that you've put in and thinking that it's its own and that it should execute it. So you can do the same thing with MongoDB. Right? Like any sort of injection flaw, it's the same thing. You're tricking it into using what should be data, but executing it like code. So what this is, is it's basically saying, um, look for all the users named this with a password that is not null. So 
every user has to have something in the password field. So that means that there's always going to be something there. It means it's always going to be not null, which means it's always true, which means it always comes back successful, and you've just logged in. And it's a problem with Express, right? So I'm not casting my parameters that I'm bringing in. So it's just raw, it's just executing. And if I just put them in strings or put them in little single ticks or wrapped them in like JSON notation, that would not have happened. But again, I don't in, know what I'm doing. Yeah, input validation and input yeah. sanitization would yeah. have solved this problem. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so there are a bunch of other vulnerabilities on this application. Um, but we are not going to go into all of those today. Yeah. There's like 25 of them. Um, but you can full screen this. Yep. I could not full okay. screen this. OK. I got there we go. Yeah, so what you could do is this is pretty simple. You could just go to GitHub. You could clone the repo. The repo is one 12 character Docker YAML file. If you're going to take a picture, take a picture of this one. If you're going to take a picture of just one slide, take it of this. And then you can just run Docker Compose up. It'll pull all the containers from Docker Hub, and you will be off and running. It is so, literally two lines. Yeah. And you know, like we're going to try to get that CTF mode up and running, but it should be a fun way of like looking at APIs, looking at more modern web apps. You know, we're trying to move away from like the, oh, hey, I put an apostrophe in a search bar, and I got a SQL error. Because I mean, as bad as those vulnerabilities are, they're, you know, you don't see them every day anymore. Maybe you do. I don't know. Maybe I just don't see them every day. Does anyone see those every day? I'm having a hard time finding them. So people are getting better at application security, which is good, which is good. Doesn't mean that there's not new vulnerabilities coming out, right? So there's new ways to look at apps, right? And this is sort of just trying to showcase a way that you could look at more modern web app and you know, have at it. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. That's actually yeah. It's kind of yeah. could be like a museum of fun old exploits. <laughs> Where everything's new again, or is that is I that, don't is that I IoT? Coming back. Although I don't know. There was a uh, on this year where they were attacking you know, yesterday's problems, like problems from the nineties, with today's tools. Like oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, there was a uh, presentation at SummerCon um, this year where they were demonstrating how to attack problems that actually show up in a lot of CTFs. It's like you know problems from the nineteen nineties using modern tools and I think they were like it, yeah it's a total like you know bloodbath but the um, you know I, I call it uh, solving yesterday's problems with tomorrow's systems today <laughs> <laughs> oh it's so good it's so good yeah SummerCon just to tell everyone what that is it's a, another hacker conference in New York it takes place every summer in June, right? yeah, June. Oh. in Brooklyn so you should all go to that? Yeah, it's great. SummerCon. One word? One word. If you want more information, he's got yeah. it. He's the guy. All right. So that's it. If you guys want to become part of this project, we are recruiting. We are recruiting ideas, apps, developers, people who want to like work on. If you have a tool that you're writing that you think could work well against this app, let's, let's, let's talk. Yeah. Um, you know. If you're going to take a picture of two slides, this is the second slide you want to take a picture of. <laughs> <laughs> right? I'll just set up a rule, Tom. <laughs> just send it to you. <laughs> but yeah, our plan is eventually to add more things, and if you give us more ideas, or if you tell us about horrible things you've seen, or maybe send us sanitized copies. No, just no. give us the idea. Yeah, just give us the out. idea, and yeah. we'll make it messy and put it up. So, so who has the mic and wants to walk around and help people ask questions so that the people that are streaming can hear it? Perfect. Someone's coming to you with a mic. That, that, that gentleman right there. Hello? Yep. So is there any way to make Pixie safe and secure? Or is it so bad? Oh. Because we've got to look at the other side, too. We have to show programmers and developers how to actually program right. Yeah, I mean, there's probably ways to clean it up a little. Yeah, we could fix it. Is that it. another project? Well, we're going to create like documentation and other things to go along with this slowly. Not tomorrow, but like, so we're going to release little things and um, document more things. And with each thing, 
if you're going to show a vulnerability, then you want to talk about it after, usually when you have more time than this, about like how you could have avoided each one of those things. Right? Yeah, but a, a lot of the problems, some, a majority of them are like business logic problems on the API. And those are sometimes really hard to scan and test for, right? These are things that automated tools, I, I don't know. I don't yeah. know if one that's just going to find all of it. We've been yeah. running a lot against it. It's, yeah. you know. So it's one of those you sort of have to get in the head of that developer and try to understand like what they're thinking and you know run all sorts of bizarre requests and all sorts of bizarre methods and see what shakes out. So you know I think that's what we were trying to do is try to write something that wasn't so obvious, that wasn't so you know overt, and something that's a little bit like people will learn more. Yeah. But but in terms of that, the business logic, for example, are there ways of telling a developer how to design the application? Correctly. Yeah, I mean things like you know make sure you check to make sure it's somebody is your own photo before you delete it. I mean I think that these are things like I don't know exactly what formal training looks like, but that's it seems like oh yeah that's so common sense, but you'd be surprised at how like you know it's not. And sometimes these, these things get complicated. And I think the world of like the DevOps microservices world is like is sort of introducing a lot more complexity. I don't know. Maybe someone thinks I'm completely wrong and it's introducing <laughs> less complexity, but no, no, you're I don't think that it's you're less definitely complicated right. either. So at all. So there's a question over there. What do you guys think of the name DevSlop? <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah, she came up with it. It's good, right? <laughs> I don't know yeah. if you do. <laughs> Hi there. Hi. Good presentation. Do you guys ever do fuzzing against APIs? And if so, what tools do you use for that? Yeah, so we've been trying to figure this out with the Zap tool. But yeah, you can fuzz with Postman. You can fuzz with anything that can make web requests. Mm -hmm. You can fuzz using Zap. Yeah. You know, you just get a bunch of good word lists and things like that, and you can start fuzzing against these APIs. Burps added some new yeah. plugins to parse a whole bunch of stuff recently. So if you have a description of the API in Swagger or some other uh, you know, description language for APIs, do uh, what tools do you like for generating templates to do automated testing, regression testing, okay. or any of that stuff? Or is it there, entirely manual driven? Yeah, that doesn't exist right now. Yeah, we, we want to build stuff like that. Uh -huh. Real. Selenium, yeah, that's a good that's a good okay. tool to use. Yeah, I mean, we haven't hit automated testing here with, with Pixie yet. Um, but yeah, we should probably run some of those tools against it, see what they shake out as. I'll, I'll give you a free copy. Um, <laughs> Ooh. Like so here, each, here's right? here's the real question: Are there are there any tools for testing uh, endpoints, where your endpoints are? Because that seems to be the biggest problem for most organizations. They don't know where their API endpoints are. I don't, I don't think this is covering that. API endpoints, as in who is what? Just like where they are. Yeah. Who's exactly. listening? Who's listening? Or where uh, the data exactly? Is from? So. Here's the scenario. We've seen a couple of cases from certain things where from investigations, that's how they were doing backdoors. They were adding mm -hmm. APIs that couldn't be discovered. Can't you just end map everything, way, yeah. discover everything, look through it painfully? But I guess it would still be happening over some sort of web port, right? Which depending yeah. on what you have in the network in line would... Right. Yeah, you actually have to know where they are. That's the big problem. Well, but I feel like that would become less of an API problem, more of like your network telemetry problem, maybe. And like having a firewall that looks like Swiss cheese. Or knowing who you're, like being able to map your endpoints, IP addresses to actually where that physical machine is, like where it is, right? Yep. Maybe? I don't know. But that's pretty clever. That's a good one. I used to work somewhere and we referred to our firewall as the Swiss cheese. <laughs> Any more questions over there? What's the URL? No, so like we've been putting it up on, I was going to say throwing it up on DigitalOcean, but it sounds all wrong. No, I mean, it, you, it, it's a Docker Compose file. You could yeah. wherever there's, you could have a Docker machine. So yeah. you could use like DigitalOcean, Amazon, Amazon's. You should run it yourself because we keep taking it down and destroying it and beating it up and adding Digital stuff to it. Easy. Like literally, she's re releasing a billion times a day right now. But hopefully, that's going to, we're going to calm down. But the point is, is you want to go to Docker and get the newest version so you can have. The newest stuff. Yeah. yeah. Continuous delivery, man. <laughs> <You know? laughs> oh, thank you. All right. All right. 